Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Sinkula. I'm the CEO of AgriSecure. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. We're really glad that uh, you're taking time out of the day to be with us. Um, and, you know, although it's really unfortunate that we can't be together uh, in person in the field, one of the things that was really exciting for the AgriSecure team as we started to put this together was the ability to look at a broader set of fields uh, and a broader set of, uh, of, of different opportunities or things that are happening across our network. So we're really excited about today's discussion. discussion. Um, and we really do hope that it is a discussion. So one of the things that we value uh, is the questions and experiences of others. So to minimize background noise, I've kept everyone on mute. Uh, but if you have a question, there's a few ways that you can get engaged. One is to click the raise your hand uh, button uh, in the Zoom controls. That'll let me know that you want to speak or that you have a question. I will uh, then open it up or uh, open up your line for an appropriate time to ask questions. You can also type a question into the chat function or the Q&A function, and I'll do my best to get to those at an appropriate time. So if you have a question that we're gonna touch on in a few slides, I may not address it right away, but don't fear I'll address any and all questions uh, before we wrap up the session. We will be taking a some breaks throughout the content to make sure that you have an opportunity to ask your questions, but the chat function and the Q&A function are a great way to ask them real time. For those of you who aren't familiar with AgriSecure, I just wanted to spend, say a few words about what we do. So AgriSecure was founded by organic farmers for organic farmers. Uh, they, our founders had transitioned their farming operations to organic production uh, to help with the longevity and the vitality of their family farms. And they'd collaborated together and shared knowledge and developed some systems and processes. And over time realized that they built out a platform that was really strong in helping organic farms succeed, primarily their organic farms. But when they looked around the landscape, they realized that other farmers could benefit from what they had built. And that was how AgriSecure was born. And we really do this in four different ways. One, we share our organic expertise and innovation, and that's growing every day because of the network that we have, and we rely on that network to continue to push our thinking and the thinking of our members forward and how to make organic as successful as possible. We take a really rigorous approach to farm planning and execution. For those of you who have organic expertise, you know that execution uh, is at a premium uh, to deliver success, and so we have a very, uh, thoughtful approach on how to do that, and we developed a tool called My Farm, which is online that can support that planning and execution, and then also collects all the information required for certification. With certification, we can manage cert the certification process for you, or we can leverage the tool that we have to help remove uh, and reduce the headaches and time and frustration with the certification process. And then finally, we can help you understand organic grain markets where are there opportunities to sell, and how to come up with a thoughtful risk management approach for organic grain marketing when futures, markets, and options, and hedging aren't necessarily opportunities that are available to you. So we really hope that um, if you're interested in learning more about AgriSecure, you can reach out to us. Uh, at the end, we'll share our phone number and contact information, or you can go onto the website and reach out to anybody on our team and we'd be happy to talk with you about what we do and if we might be able to help your operation. Oops, sorry. For today's agenda, uh, we're gonna be talking about crops and techniques that are critical for the success of an organic operation. Uh, from, we'll be talk, touching upon corn and the opportunities there to continue to improve the yield and uh, weed management practices in corn. And soybeans will be talking about a challenging crop and how to manage through and not some ideas and things that we're working on to try, being, to try allowing soybeans to become a uh, part of an organic rotation. We'll be touching upon equipment, both the basics of what we think need to be, you need to get right, as well as some of the things that can be optional tools and what's on the future. And then we'll be wrapping it up with some thoughts on long-term rotations. Again, we'll have a Q&A session at the end, but we do hope to get Q&A throughout, throughout the, the bulk of the discussion today. 
one of the things uh, that I'm really proud of uh, as the CEO of AgriSecure is the team we have. Uh, they're professionals. They're extremely well-versed and have a lot of expertise that's complementary to each other. Uh, and they're really good people and passionate about helping our members succeed and the larger community continue to advance what organic production can mean for the U.S. farmer. Today, you'll be hearing from Bryce Rolbeck, who's a co-founder and a farmer at BNB Rolbeck Farms, Amy Brook, uh, co-founder and a farmer at Cyclone Farms, Ken Jenkins, who's an account executive, and he'll introduce himself uh, in the areas that he serves, and a farmer with Goliath Egg, and then Pete Kaputska, who's also an account executive and a farmer with Red Pill Organics. The one person who you won't hear from today is Kim Henson. Uh, she is also a fantastic account executive serving Nebraska. So if you're in Nebraska and you want to learn more about uh, uh, AgriSecure or Colorado and some of the, the states around there, please reach out to Kim. Uh, she'd be happy to talk with you. And then finally, before we get started, I want to just take a moment to think about or talk about why are we here today. Whether you have years of organic experience or are new to uh, organic production, you're here because you realize that organic, the organic opportunity is really compelling, but it's not easy. Uh, it's not easy for our founders. Every year we continue to try to get better, and we think that there is power in numbers. We're here today to talk about uh, corn because success or failure in corn is essential to an operation. If you get corn right, that creates a great foundation for long-term success, but if you struggle with it, it it's going to be challenging. We're here to talk about soybeans because we're trying to find the right formula for soybeans. It's needed to make U.S. organic production uh, flourish and continue to grow, and it's something that we're interested in hearing your ideas. And ultimately, we're here because we think operations that get the long-term and in-season planning and execution right will stand the test of time, and we hope that we can be a part of finding the solutions to take organic to the next level. So with that, I want to hand it over to Bryce to, to, bring, to introduce himself and to kick off the discussion on organic corn. Bryce? Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everyone. Bryce Rolbeck here, co-founder of AgriSecure, an organic producer in West Central Iowa. Uh, for the next about 30 minutes here, we'll talk about the most profitable crop uh, for most people in organic, and that's organic corn. We'll walk through a couple of scenarios, one on my farm, a uh, couple on a, a customer's farms that uh, give you a better picture of the management of organic corn, the profitability of organic corn, and the economics of organic corn. So it'll take about the next 30 minutes, and the first uh, few slides will be one of the farms that uh, just turned organic for a, for a B and B or Best Farms. Uh, so this location is Manning, Iowa. Uh, we planted this corn at about 34,500. Our normal normal planting population is around that 31, 32. We bump it up, knowing that we're going to lose a few plants because of field activities. We've been 113 day. Uh, this was actually planted June 1st, and we'll go over why we planted late here. Uh, silty loam, very good soil. Uh, one of those farms that uh, was in our family for 120 years, very good fertility because that's where grandpa hauled all the manure. So a very good farm overall. Uh, we transitioned through two years of alfalfa. A uh, very good transition is one of the one, one of the first fields that we transitioned with alfalfa, understanding the benefits, and I'll walk through that a little bit. But our yield target is 180. We've been dry this year. Uh, 200 would have been possible on this field if we would have caught some rain in July. We did catch some at the end uh, here last couple weeks, three inches. So feel like we still have good potential, but uh, again, we'll go through the, the economics on that and understand why 180 bushels is, is a good yield. And so looking through the early season, this is a couple of our other fields here, uh, June 8th. This, these fields are, were planted May 25th, so we're just walking through a little bit on our farm what we've seen early on. Uh, talking through planting dates and, and uh, when to plant, these fields are actually planted April 25th, which we aired too early and had to replant on May 25th. Uh, too cold of weather to come up, the weeds came up with it and created issues. So we just decided to replant the uh, entire corn crop that was planted April 25th. We do have grass and in rows, but you can see that the corn beat it up, uh, allowing us a good cultivation path to take out most of those weeds. 
So we had better than better than average uh, weed control this year. If you go in there right now, just with the dry weather, uh, being able to get in the field timely. And so you're going to see some weeds early on, but having them that small with the corn as tall as it is allows for good weed control. We still feel these fields have 180 bushel potential. Again, not top yield potential being planted a little bit later in the dry weather. Uh, we can see over here on the right, we had this field planted May 28th. Uh, planting a little bit later, having the rotation we have allows us to rotary hoe once and cultivate once, uh, especially with the lack of moisture uh, that we've experienced this year. So going back to the field that we started with, this is June 29th. Remember this is planted uh, June 5th and cultivated once, rotary hoed once after two years of alfalfa. Uh, actually, we might get very lucky this year on our planting date as we did not pollinate during the 9,500 degree weather. We pollinated and tasseled in that 75 to 85 degree weather and caught a rain right before that. So not that we're any better farmers for doing that, uh, just lucky that we planted late, late and hit the right windows. Uh, just something to note, we took two and a half tons of alfalfa off the first cutting of this. We don't always recommend doing that. We did it for uh, testing purposes, but uh, two and a half tons uh, is quite considerable amount of income to to start off with. And then to have a corn stand like we've seen uh, looks pretty good. So this was taken a uh, day ago out there, same field, same view. As you can see, the, the corn's tasseled, uh, it's pollinated. We're in brown silk now. Uh, it's been very dry, but this field in the last three, four weeks has caught about, actually the last three weeks has got about four and a half inches. Uh, good weed control, one rotary hoe pass, one cultivation, and that only happens because we had two years of alfalfa. So 12, 13 cuttings of alfalfa, 13 times we took weeds out of this farm that we're able to not put as much management into it and still have the same weed control. Uh, being a little bit later, we know we're going to have to dry the corn, so it's just one of the, the planning things that we have to plan for. We do see western uh, cutworm beetles in there, but uh, it, it's not enough to go out and, and control them. And, and I know people are probably wondering uh, what happened to this corn yesterday. And so this is taken early in the morning before the storm. Yesterday we went back out there, and there was nothing, nothing wrong with it. No, there was. We couldn't find one broken off or blown over, and I'm not gonna, it's not because it's organic, so I'm not gonna tell people because it's organic. I think it's because we were younger. Uh, we didn't have the year weight, uh, a little bit more flexible than the stuff planted around us as conventional that's uh, uh, planted April 25th. So actually our organic fields are pretty much all standing very well, 100%, where a lot of corn around us was flat on the ground. Again, it's not going to say because it's organic. It's, I think it's because it was a lot younger, more flexible, didn't have the year weight on it. So we look at this organic corn uh, field plan budget. One of the goals on B and B or by Farms or with my family is we want to we understand organic corn is still a commodity. Being a low cost producer is the the uh, still what we strive for, and how we do that is in implementing alfalfa and it allows us a lot less management on our farm per, per acre of organic corn, a lot less cost per acre of organic corn. So we look through this, we have organic paperwork, we have uh, chicken manure at $146, uh, super cal, uh, calcium sulfate, we have disking, field conditioning, planting, rotary hoeing, cultivating, crop insurance, harvesting, harvesting and drying and hauling. So our cost on this field is for, about $450 an acre, $444 an acre. Most guys are, oh, Steve, no. All right, perfect, sorry for that. Um, most, most that we see are in that 500 to 600, even a little bit higher once you figure in total nutrient costs, all the passes across the field, especially if you're in a corn soybean rotation that uh, you're gonna have a lot higher cost of production just because of the weed control, the nutrients you're, you're going to need. With our alfalfa testing it, we have 125 pounds of uh, nitrogen credit in there. And so two, three tons, two to three tons and three tons might even be overkill of manure allows us to, chicken manure allows us to complete the nutrients that are needed on that farm. 
As you can see, conservatively over there, we put $7 a bushel uh, at 175 bushels, so $1,312 of revenue, or $867 of return on management uh, for this field. And, and so just emphasizing one of the things that we wanted to show you is the, the cost of production when the crop rotation is correct versus just doing a corn soybean rotation that we'll see later on that has higher cost of production. So Bryce, one question that we've received is that you did uh, transition in alfalfa, organic corn the first year. Where are you gonna take your rotation after this year? Yeah, so we'll, we'll take the organic corn off and then we'll go to a small grain, maybe an intercropping, peas, canola, peas, barley, uh, take that off. And, and one thing that we've changed probably then uh, in the last couple of months is understanding no-till soybeans. Uh, so once we take the peas and canola off or peas and barley off, we'll uh, seed rye in August. So we'd seed it probably this week and get a really, really good rye stand, get that up two feet or so, a uh, foot and a half, two feet. Uh, be ready to early plant soybeans next spring and have earlier esthesis for the, the to roll the rye and look at no-till soybeans. Then we go, would go to three years of alfalfa and back to corn. So we have a six-year rotation. Okay, thank you. With, with that, we're gonna hand it over to Pete to introduce himself and to walk through the young farms. Thank you, Steve. Good morning. Uh, my name is Pete Kapuska. I'm the account executive for AgriSecure, uh, working the western half of Iowa, uh, western parts of Minnesota, South Dakota, uh, and other areas uh, in that northwest area of the Corn Belt. Um, I have the opportunity to work with a number of farmers out there. Uh, I guess having been a farmer myself, it's a, a great way to stay connected to agriculture. Um, and for myself, getting back into farming uh, this last year with an organic uh, piece of ground. Uh, as far as what we're looking at here, we're looking at the De Young farm. This is up in uh, north central, northwest Iowa near Lorenz, roughly about uh, halfway between Des Moines and Spencer. Um, it is a, um, a field of uh, corn that, as you can see, was uh, started out as a transition soybean, went to corn in the second year of transition. Last year is an organic field of soybeans, um, and this year is back into corn. Um, De Young's is a, a family organization. Uh, the son, Heath, is the main driver, uh, but there are other family members involved in it. Uh, while this rotation looks pretty standard corn and soybeans, they also do rotations with oats and other crops on other farms. Um, given the kind of dirt they've got and the kind of weather they've had, their yield expectation this year is around 180 bushel an acre. So as we look at what happened on the farm this year, uh, like Bryce, they had the opportunity to get in early and uh, plant uh, corn in the historical early window for most cropping years, let alone organic. Um, while you look at the picture on the left, you can see the weed control is very good. And this picture was taken after the field was timed or used a mechanical device to remove weeds um, in the row in between plants. There were other areas of the field that weren't quite as good. So while they had a good stand, rather than tearing up the field, they decided to go in with a flaming uh, tool in order to remove all those annual weeds. And as you can see from the picture, it's a kind of a rough view if you're not familiar with flaming. Uh, most people are familiar with a chemical injury, and it may look very similar in that the plants look like they're dying. However, that corn plant, the growing point is protected at that growth stage of about three to four up to five leaf. And there's a lot of moisture in that whirl where the growing point is located. So you can remove the outer leaves and vegetation and not affect the yield potential or the growth potential of that uh, corn plant. But other annual weeds, you're able to flame those. They can't recover, they die. And if we move forward to the next slide, you can see that the crop has very well recovered as we're moving into July. Uh, not only did it recover from a growth point of view, but then it also recovered in that with sometimes early planting, you can get an unevenness of stand where different soils dry out or warm up differently. So they've got a really nice even field. And as we got into tassel, uh, things looked really well. As you look at the slide on the right, you're able to see uh, this was taking in a headland area that 
the growth of the plant has pretty well shaded out the dirt. So we're not allowing sunlight to get deep into that canopy to germinate new weeds. However, where you do have traffic through that field, uh, and DeYoung's do a great job of minimizing their footprint throughout the year in that field, you are gonna open up that canopy and you will likely see some weeds come in. The good point is though, that as that crop had gotten up and gotten going, weeds that come in later while they may contribute some seeds to that weed bank in the soil, they usually don't impact yield very much. So as bad as it may look from the road, once you get out in it, and especially once you run the combine with the yield monitor, you're able to see that yields are very consistent with what their neighbors and what they have on their other fields. Move to the next slide. So at AgriSecure, one of the things we do with the certification um, components that we work with farmers is we do set budgets for each farmer on every field. In my farm, which is our, our platform-based tracking system for information. So we're able to pull that information back out at various times to see how we're doing against our budget with actual numbers. And so putting together cash flows or putting together scenarios of what ifs, we're able to determine uh, how farmers sit at any point during the, the year. So as you can see with DeYoung's, they've got a, a, a roster of things that they put together in a budget that they confirmed on the days that they did that. It's a very typical um, uh, process for what they did up and through planting. Um, after planting, they did come in with a rotary hoe. They did come up with tying weeding. You can see that flaming trip is next. And then after flaming, you want to come in and cultivate to get the best results from that activity. And then they also came in with some foliar nutrition based on samples that they've taken from leaves. So with those costs identified, we're looking at about $575 per acre. And as you look at the, the right panel, when you look at the positive economics of $7 corn, and I still expect 180, probably 180 plus, they've been catching some rains. We're looking at a good return prior to that land component. But I wanna flip the script a little bit. We talk about the value or the, the, the high return on economics. If we move to the next slide, this one, you can see that one of the things we're able to do with information is show you what if scenarios. And as we look at this, we start to realize that from my point of view, one of the big advantages of organics is that it reduced your risk exposure by reducing that break even number in terms of bushels or in terms of price. So what we have here on the left side, we've got a price point. On the upper horizontal, we have yield goals. So as we look at your specific area where you might have a cash rent identified, and in this area, we identified 275 as a cash rent. Every one of these blocks that's in the light green is a positive return above that cash rent. So when you look at, especially yesterday with the wind that came through and reduced um, yield potential based on stand reduction or just not being able to get the crop. If you're looking at a $6 price on organic corn and 145 bushel an acre, you're covering your cash rent and you're making a profit. If you're looking at a conventional scenario, that grid is radically different as far as where you need to be to hit that break even above cash rent. It's not even just the economics, but it's a psychological. If I can go to the field and with my crop insurance in organics, which would be a whole nother discussion, be able to minimize my risk by being able to protect more value in the field and with my organics, keep my operating costs reduced, I'm able to have a better profit scenario, but I'm also able to hit my break even much easier, which makes decisions in terms of marketing or planning or purchasing a lot easier to do. And that's one of the things we're able to do at AgriSecure is sit with you individually and work through these sorts of scenarios to show you where your sweet spot is as far as trying to get a good price and looking at the productivity of that field. Thanks, Pete. Uh, before, before we keep going on with the next set of slides, uh, we did have one question, and this I think was related to Bryce, but uh, I think Bryce or Pete, either of you could answer it. What is the seed running per unit currently compared to traded seed? Um, so in Bryce, he showed a cost of $75 in a planting pass. Did this number include anything else applied with that pass? And so uh, to answer that, that $75, that was non-GMO seed, uh, not organic seed in there, and is $135 a bag. 
so that comes out to about $58 and then we put $16 an acre in for planting. That's where we get that $75 just to, to answer that question. And one of the reasons we use the non-GMO seed is because we replanted every acre besides that one that we showed you uh, because it was planted a lot later after the alfalfa. And we used all of our seed replanting the other one. And there was, there was not seed left uh on the shorter day that we needed for that june 1st planting so we were able to use non-gmo in that uh so you, i think it's pretty well common to understand the non-gmo uh seed prices the organic seed prices range from 200 to 280 if you go with bex at the top end uh there there's some people at the lower end of that 200 but 200 to very very top end 280 dollars for a bag of seed corn is what the cost is running Thank you, Bryce, and thank you for the question. Keep them coming. We'll move on to top of Humboldt County. Yes, um, so about um, 30 miles uh, east of uh, the Young Farms, uh, we've got another operator that we work with, uh, top of Humboldt County. Um, they are a, um, a generational family, uh, father of the two sons. One of the sons is most actively involved in the organics. Um, they're a typical, I guess, farming operation uh, two to 3,000 uh, conventional acres. Uh, they started transitioning fields uh, back in 2018 around a hog building site initially um, and kind of took on the, uh, the profile of being then that organic farmer. Uh, the field itself actually works out extremely well given the fact that there is hog facilities on the um, footprint and they're able to make really good use of that manure. So on this field, they, they went in with a plant of population. They went in with two conventional varieties, uh, relatively speaking, national brand varieties, uh, established genetics in the area, planting date that's still on the early side, but they're in a well-drained area with clay loam and there's actually a dredge ditch. So their tiling works really well. And given their fertility and their profile, they're looking at that 180 bushel an acre crop. So as we start to go through the growing season, um, the first, uh, you want to go to the next uh, slide, Steve? Uh, this first uh, slide, can go back. Okay, so as we're looking at the um, uh, picture here on the left, uh, you can see that's about five leaf, six leaf corn. Um, from my point of view, it's especially in the um, in rows, it's relatively indistinguishable weed control wise from any other farm in the, in the area. Um, if you look at the very far um, upper left corner, you'll start to see on the other side of that dredge, uh, the headland and a little bit of grass coming in there uh, that's coming in from the ditch. Um, but throughout the rest of the field, uh, they've been very aggressive about and proactive about going through with tillage, whether it's rotary hoeing um, or tining in order to remove those early season weeds. And you can see that the field is off to a really good start. Weather has been favorable, so you can see the continued growth. As you move to uh, the second week of June, another cultivation has come through, that corn continues to grow. Uh, it's, it's still got great yield potential at this point to reach everything that any other conventional field in the area would reach. I'd say one thing too important uh, about any kind of growing crop scenario, probably certainly one of your best weed con control strategies is to have healthy corn plants or healthy plants out there. Healthy plants not only get you yield, but they also give you that ability to manage weeds by shading out and out competing weeds. And as you look at the 4th of uh, 3rd of July picture here, you're able to see a very even field of corn, uh, tightly canopied. So weed control within the field is really good in terms of uh, not having any reduction or not contributing anything to the weed bank. But there again, we saw in that earlier photo, there's, there's parts of the field because of either encroachment or um, traffic that you just don't always get weed control that's perfect. So there are other management strategies that, uh, that were employed to manage those small areas and, and around ponded areas that were mowing or removing crop and weeds uh, just to make sure there was nothing further uh, going into the weed bank. Now that we're at full tassel, um, I've been back to this field a couple times. Yeah, it certainly does have 100% of the yield potential that's out there. You can see that first row of uh, corn uh, in the foreground of this picture that um, it doesn't quite have the same vigor, um, but that's to be expected. 
and around those uh, wet areas or heavily compacted areas, that's what you're ending up with. So in some sense, you, you would maybe look at sacrificing those areas in terms of yield to get the greater good of managing weeds at a long term. And uh, given the fertility and the yield outlook look on this farm, uh, the decision to, to take out the mower and hit those areas uh, makes a lot of sense. And there again, we do put budgets together. So uh, the budget for top of uh, Humboldt County is very similar to what a conventional farmer would have been probably about 40, 50 years ago before we had commercial herbicides. A lot of tillage, a lot of timing, um, and then looking at the break evens and the, the overall cost exposure, uh, looks like he's um, in a very profitable scenario going forward. One other thing I would say too is, is this is a piece of ground that is, uh, and other pieces that farmers have are owned pieces of ground. We do need to keep in mind that when we put our budgets together, we're using custom rates, typically Iowa State custom rates. Those are costs that you need to account for as you go through to determine the profitability and the effectiveness of how organics fit into your farming operation. But bear in mind, especially as you're looking at transitioning uh, crop acres, that if you already own the equipment, there's an ownership cost that's not an out-of-pocket cost. So as you look at this budget, even though it's for organic, if you're doing transition farming and trying to do corn, this is the same budget on the right. Unfortunately, on the left, the economics are you're selling into that conventional market at that bushel amount that you expect in organics. So transitioning can be very difficult if you have ownership of the equipment. It's not an out-of-pocket at a custom rate. It's probably an out-of-pocket at the operational costs, which are fuel, maintenance, um, interest, and replacement. Uh, so those economics we can customize to your uh, desire to see what your true or actual cost may be. Thanks, Pete. We do have a question coming in uh, with, uh, regarding cover crop. So no cover crop to keep the soil covered during the winter and hold on to fall apply manure and nutrients ahead of corn? Uh, that's a good strategy for using uh, cover crops from a uh, a managing of, of soil erosion and uh, either wind or water erosion. Um, I think a lot of what we look at at AgriSecure in terms of cover crops, we're also looking at what we can do from a nutrient point of view. Uh, Bryce talked earlier about uh, alfalfa being a crop, and in this case a cover crop, that not only improves the tilt of the soil with its uh, growth pattern, also in, in helps with your weed management, but it also provides nitrogen. A, a lot of cover crops uh, that don't provide nitrogen still break down or solubilize the nutrients into the, in the soil. And then as that plant decays here, those nutrients become more plant available. So there's different strategies for uh, cover crops. And I think one of the best nice things about organics is that we do a lot of small grains uh, in our rotations with organics. And as you remove a small grain in July or early August, it gives you plenty of time to grow on a cover crop. For me, one of the frustrating things to see is, is a farmer who's a conventional corner seed or soybean farmer or someone who is harvesting both of those crops, come in after harvest, invest a lot of money in a cover crop and get very little growth in the fall. Yeah, they're gonna help protect the soil from wind and, and water erosion, but they're not doing a lot provide nutrients for that next cropping system. Uh, and I think cover crops go hand in hand with organics uh, for managing weeds and then bringing fertility to that next crop. And, uh, and to add in on that question, Pete, uh, why there's no cover crop in this budget is it, more of a management uh, than a, a decision not to use cover crops. Uh, we find a lot of people when they first get into organic, and we know this is his first organic field, uh, the, the management level increases so much more that it, it's, cover crops are a second thought to why you're learning as the first part of it, because cover crops can cause a lot of issues too, if not, not understood and not managed well uh, from a lot of different angles. I, I, I've ran into it a lot and re, and really rethought our cover crop strategy to be much more simple than what it what it started out to be. So one of the reasons you don't see it in this budget is because 
be focused on managing organic corn. Cover crops are really good. We really support them. We really want uh, growers to utilize them. Uh, but you have to get the basics down first before you can uh, get into the, some of those some of those uh, management that uh, takes a little takes a little bit more time. So I would say in the future he's probably going to get into more cover crops, uh, especially with the harvest and the manure he's putting on. Well, and, and I would add to that, Brian, as, as we work together, uh, we are introducing into upcoming rotations more cereal grains um, to that rotation. So that in and of itself will be part of that learning curve that'll make cover crops easier to manage. Um, even people who have not raised oats recently, it could be challenging to go back to especially if you're looking at a rye or a winter type crop. Um, but those are both options for the budget. And I'd say options because we do want a lot of flexibility just in terms of uh, a market price and economics. But we have to look at what Mother Nature gives us in terms of weather. You know, maybe go winter wheat, but if we don't get a good window to plant this fall, then we look at, um, at a, a spring barley crop or a spring oat crop instead. And if that doesn't happen, at another window for another opportunity to come in with a crop that makes economic sense, but also a rotation or gives us flexibility in a rotation to take advantage of markets or weather. And we have two other questions that we'll just want to uh, answer for this one. So, Pete, what was uh, used as this, uh, the, the grower sprayed uh, in June? Yep, we did look at paganic and regalia. So we looked at a fungicide and an insecticide. Um, given the um, value of the crop, um, it made sense to look at protecting what we had. Out. Okay. And then how do the weak spots uh, cared for after mowing? So what were they doing in those areas that they mowed? Right. Well, they just continue to mow those uh, through harvest and then they till them with the rest of the field. Okay. So as much as you can, you want to try to isolate or manage those acres so that they don't affect the higher productive acres on those fields. Perfect. Thanks, Pete. Now we're going to transition to Amy. Amy, you want to introduce yourself and, and cover what's going on in your farm? Sure, Steve. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is Amy Brook. I'm an advisor for AgriSecure and an owner operator of Cyclone Farms near York, Nebraska. And I guess I just want to say my heart goes out to all that were affected by yesterday's storm. That was really um, very sad this time of year to have that happen. So you all are in my thoughts. Um, now switching gears to another approach on organic farming for corn. There are multiple ways really to achieve the same goal. And um, what we're looking here is uh, a picture of one of my corn fields. Um, very tall corn. Hopefully the ears, um, ears reflect, I guess, the energy that was put into the height of the corn. Um, one thing to note, my population is a lot uh, lower than um, so the other two examples that Bryce and Pete um, went over. And that's because my philosophy is, you know, I do not believe seed is my limiting factor on my farms. I'm kind of, and I'm not trying to stress out any seed dealers if there's any on the call today, but my belief is a thousand seeds will equal um, 10 bushel an acre if you don't have any limiting factors. So 30,000 seeds should give you about 300 bushel crop potential. If you're not getting 300 bushel, which um, I definitely am not, then I know that there's something else going on that I need to evaluate in terms of why am I not getting my yield. Um, I do plant, you know, about 31.5 is what I like my final stand to be under my irrigation. Um, so then I can manage my nutrients appropriately for that plant population. Um, my yield goal is uh, 200 plus and trying to get that on every acre. You know, some acres are better than others, but try to get uh, that for a field average at least. And uh, my soils are a little bit lighter, Hastings silt loam, traditionally pretty good on drainage. Usually we don't get that much rain, but the last few years we've been getting more rain than, than normal. So we've had to modify our plans accordingly. But kind of moving on into the next slide, you'll see some action shots. Prior to emergence um, with my corn, I like to go into uh, the field and do two tine weeder passes. Post emergence, I get out my rotary hoe. Uh, you see the picture there on the left is from May 29th. 
Um, I plan truly to be in my field every three to five days is what my field plan says. And then I alter that based on rainstorms, try to be proactive if I know a rain's coming and get around in my fields. And then I try to get in my fields as soon as possible post rain events, because that rain is just gonna germin you know, stimulate the next germination of weeds. So I'd really try to um, get, the, get out there as frequently as possible um, really early on because um, weeds really take a lot less effort to remove at that white root hair state. Um, when you get them established, you know, it just takes a lot more energy and effort and more soil movement. And I really try to minimize, um, you know, the amount of soil movement. So using uh, equipment such as time weeder, flamer, and uh, rotary hoe are kind of key to my early operation. Um, and then just with the rotary hoe, speed is truly critical. Getting out there, you know, we try to target uh, north of 14 uh, mile per hour. So you need to be careful in your fields if they're uneven, bouncing around, but the speed really um, dictates uh, the excellence and how that equipment operates. Um, if you look at the right picture, that's a motion shot of spot flaming. I did have to uh, leverage my flamer this year doing some spot flaming treatments on, on this field in particular. Um, what I recommend is if you are seeing weeds, you know, identify weed problems very quickly because it's never going to get better if you see those darn things established. Um, you can't really see them in this picture, but they're there. They were, you know, really about that quarter to half inch. I could identify what I had. I had water hemp and um, I had velvet leaf and I, broad leaves are really great to attack with a flamer. So I got rid of those right away. Torch setup is key. You know, you want to put your torches if you have a flamer uh, really close to that plant root base. As Pete mentioned, you know, the grow point is protected on the corn. You're going to see physical damage, visual damage on your corn, but um, that's not, you know, necessarily going to affect any yield. And in a couple of days, you're going to have that new growth of green leaves coming out. So it's quite a process, a little nerve wracking at first, but uh, have faith in the system and it'll, it'll pay off. But my recommendation is if you are going to flame, definitely plan on cultivating as soon as possible because, you know, some of these weeds like Palmer right now, Palmer really doesn't um, die with a flamer. So it does set Palmer back. The grow point is really tucked in on that Palmer amaranth as well. It sets it back, but if you can bury it, you're gonna at least delay, delay it from affecting any of your corn as the season goes on. Um, moving on kind of as the year progresses, you can see a couple pictures. One is below canopy that was taken on 617. And my philosophy on weed management is kind of threefold actually. Eliminating weeds truly reduces your insect and disease pressure as the season goes on. Um, and it, they just really are all three nuisances and they're truly related to each other. Um, so really kind of focusing hard on that weed management will make your life a little bit easier. It's, there's no guarantees on the insects and disease um, that they'll be eliminated if you don't have weeds, but they'll definitely be greatly reduced. Um, also with um, cultivating, basically your speed, depth, and your footprint in the row is really important. I love cultivators with multiple adjustments just to get um, the right setup every time I go out there. And footprint, I would just recommend you can adjust the size of your sweeps in the field. Um, I like to have a wide footprint as, as I go and get very close to that root base, plant root base, to just try to eliminate weeds as much as possible. And um, it's, it's helpful to have RTK, you know, when you're establishing your furrows. But basically, once you get those furrows established, the first time you cultivate, you're going to pretty much be in those same wheel tracks the whole time throughout the rest of the season. Um, on 629, that was actually my last cultivation pass. I did four of them this year. I try to start early on the cultivation. Um, and this is the last one I creep in there, right? Right at canopy, you know, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but I verify that I'm not snapping off any plants. Um, on one field, not this field in particular, but on another field at this point, right at canopy, I did spread um, cover crop in in um, the corn and um, that's established and and I'm just trying to evaluate the the positivity of that but if you are going to put cover crop in at this stage you got to wait till basically you're completely canopied so you don't have any competition with your cover crop in the crop and um, one last thing that I learned this season um, and it 
it's really truly a need. I borrowed a neighbor's tractor of mine this year and he had an hydraulic top link and that was just beautiful when you're running your cultivator, you know, if you have um, uneven emergence with your corn and you have some short corn and tall corn in the same field, you know, you can just easily adjust, you know, real quickly if you have, um, adjust your cultivator real quickly if you have that hydraulic top link because um, that is just a really nice feature to add on to a tractor. And then the kind of some of the final picks, um, late season here, these were taken on August 7th. Um, basically what you're trying to do is reduce your stress for the crop, all the ones you can control, you know, throughout the season. So you can get that uniform ear height and that higher ear positioning on your plant. Um, you know, some of the stresses that are in your control are nutrients and reducing weeds and uh, insects and disease. Um, water is one that is in some people's control if you have irrigation and, and not with others. So, you know, you just try to do the best on the things that you can control. And then looking at um, your ear leaf, that is really important. I didn't know how important it was, but um, if you have, you know, a five inch ear leaf, that is amazing. That's going to usually indicate qualitatively that you have, you know, a little bit of a nirvana going on in your field that you've had the right nutrient balance and you're going to have good photosynthesis to feed that, feed that um, main ear coming off that ear leaf. So kind of looking at that as a good qualitative measure, but definitely take tissue samples throughout the season to just understand what's going on with your, your crops. Um, and then I wish the picture on the right, I wish all my ears look like that. They don't but this is um, one that is 20 around and this is on an organic variety of corn that I planted. Um, just kind of shows you the potential, you know, these, these um, oh, the genetics that we're able to use even, even through the organics have a lot of good potential, you know, if you are placing them on the right fields. This one was 114 day crop. And um, you just, again, need to um, elim eliminate plant stresses and then um, monitor that time period between tassel and ear development. You know, Pete kind of mentioned about some biologicals that are available for insecticides and fungicides, but you know, that would be the time to deploy them if you are having um, any challenges is that tassel to ear development stage. And then kind of looking at the overall roadmap, I did put cover crop in in the spring. I was unable to get in my fields due to um, a little bit of a late wet harvest last year. So I didn't get the fall cover crops planted. I did the spring. Um, I leveraged a couple guys in the network to, um, to get some of the crops they had grown. I got field peas and also oats from a couple guys in the network and I, I spread those. I put my litter on and worked all that in. Um, May 1st, I did do dry spreading of some organic micronutrients. And um, I take annual soil samples um, and it showed I did have some deficiencies on zinc and manganese and um, magnesium. So I was able to uh, leverage those soil samples, show my certifier I had deficiencies and I found, I found um, organic micronutrients that I could spread. So I did that in the dry form. Um, I wanted to let my cover crop grow, so I waited very late to do my field conditioning prior to planting. I did a back-to-back -back just to make sure I could eliminate and reduce as much of that cover crop as possible. I thought if you know some stragglers were there, it'd be it wouldn't affect the crop too much, but it actually did. Every every oat plant that I did not terminate actually um, reduced the height of my corn. They kind of did compete to eat with each other, so. Just food for thought, it's good if you're doing those spring planted cover crops to really terminate them as best as possible because they can um, potentially compete with your primary crop that you're trying to grow. Um, and then uh, my, I did my weed management passes. Um, I did also split apply my litter this year. This was something new. I obtained a heavy um, high boy spreader in the same wheel tracks as my um, track tractor. So I was able to split apply litter, which was very interesting. I cultivated that in and then um, irrigated it in as well. And then I guess right now I am just evaluating, you know, pests that are in the area. There's um, some disease pressure with um, some southern rust. So if, 
if I were to need the spray, if that is um, coming into my fields, I would leverage probably regalia for that. It's a systemic fungicide and I can use my pivot to um, just water that in so it can be uptaken by the roots. And then just kind of um, hopefully targeting the end of October for harvest and hauling that into town. So, so thank I appreciate your time, yeah. Thank you, Amy, that was fantastic. Uh, one question we got, and I, and I think you're particularly well suited to talk about this is, do we have any experience with cover cropping in season with corn? So for example, applying a cover crop in a stage like V6 to V8. Yeah, that's a great question. And um, that is what I'm trying to experiment with. I know what people, I think Bryce has had experience with this in the past and we kind of compared some notes. Um, one thing that I was able to leverage, it's a Kuhn, K-U-H-N spreader. It's European. Um, it's, it's a very interesting spreader. I was able to throw cover crop, which was uh, more of a clover mix. Crimson is actually, crimson clover is pretty shade tolerant. So I had a heavy amount of crimson clover in there and then um, a couple other grasses that I put in there that I don't know if I'll like that or not. So I can get back to you on that. But really, I'm just seeing that I applied it pretty close to closed canopy, so there wasn't a lot of light hitting the ground. And I'm not seeing that there's any competition between the cover crop and the actual corn, which is great. And those species should overwinter. So hope, I'm, my hope is that it, it's established and uh, you know, I can take that into the spring. I have in the past, you know, when I was a conventional farmer, I spread cover crop into my seed corn um, right when it was uh, right after tassel. And that was just great as well. I just like if you can establish those cover crops early and let them get you know, tall enough to overwinter, you're, you're going to have a really great situation for the spring and hopefully generate nitrogen to your crop um, the next year. Thank you, Amy. Yep. So moving along, I wanted to say a little bit about this slide before I hand it over to Bryce. One of the questions we get a lot from farmers in our network is planting date. And so last year we took a look at planting data from our network based upon planting date and yields. Uh, as you might recall, last year there's a lot of variation in, in planting dates. Um, and so the data we're looking at right now, uh, because it's 69 data points across our network in Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, and South Dakota, Dakota we really culled the data to make sure that we thought it was uh, actual data. And um, it's just one of the ways that AgriSecure is working with our member base uh, to pull together information and share it back regarding topics of interest where there's been a lack of data in the organic community. And so Bryce, do you want to say uh, a little bit about this and talk more generally about planting dates and what you've learned over time? Yeah, thank you, Steve. And, and so this is, is very interesting data um because it, it doesn't really exist for organic and one of the things that we know in conventional there's tons of data out there from about any source that you can imagine of, of how to plant when to plant what seed to plant how how what population should you plant uh pretty accurate data and that, that doesn't really exist in organic at any scale and, and so looking at this and we plan to hopefully be able to do this again this year to get stronger data points uh, and it's actually, it is following what we're, what I'm seeing in the field. Uh, we planted April 24th this year because we got done planting some of our conventional uh, April 15th. And we were just sitting around waiting and it's, I think it was 80 degrees on that day and it looked like the weather was going to be good and that turned out not to be true. And so we're seeing what's showing us uh, earlier planting dates provide more risk. Uh, there's, there is more reward. Uh, but more risk in the chance of uh, colder weather, weed establishment, those type of things that uh, prevent higher yields at the end. And so one of the big learning things that we've, we've decided on our farm is, you know, the May 15th, uh, no matter if we're done planting or everybody else is done planting around us, it's one of the hard things to wait for. If you're just sitting around and everybody's planted, uh, May 15th seems to be one of those dates, uh, at least uh, throughout our network, that... Uh, has the higher chance of successfulness. And, and as a farm, we'd even push it into May 25th. Uh, just the, the weed control issues go down significantly in those uh, 
25 days or 30 days from April 25th, and even that May 15th to May 25th, uh, we see we see the the weed issues and the emergence go up significantly. And so this, this data is validating that for us, at least on a small scale. Uh, it's different on every farm, but uh, for us, we feel pushing that planting date uh, back, even suffering our, our uh, giving up a little bit of yield on the top end. Uh, for weed control and risk, uh, we, we feel that pushing that date later is, is beneficial for us. But the, the data that we're able to gather from the network and be able to understand that and make those decisions off of that is, is very important uh, and, and allows us to not make a gut decision anymore, but each year to refine that decision and understand the statistics and data. So the takeaways for our, that uh, we have learned at AgriSecure uh, is hit singles and doubles seem to win more than swinging for a home run. Uh, planning on 240 bushel corn uh, first year out of the gate or first couple of years is probably not realistic. 180 is more realistic to, to 200. So hit those singles and doubles, fertilize for, you know, that a little bit over 200. Put your, put your plans together for a little bit over at 180 to 200 and hit those singles and doubles. And, and we seem to see more wins than swinging for the fence. Uh, rotation, as you saw in, in a lot of ours, rotation is key to success, whether that's two years of alfalfa or cover crops before it. Uh, you're starting two years out on organic corn to, to set that up. Your planting date is very important. Uh, it's going to change every year. Uh, you don't want to plant into, into rain or moisture that's going to last two weeks. You don't want to plant into cold weather. So that's a that's a changing decision every year. Uh, nutrition, where do you get it? What kind of nutrition do you use throughout the year and at the beginning are huge. Uh, understanding what uh, is available in the nutrients that you're using. And then weed management are critical factors. That planting date, the rotation, the nutrition all ties into weed management and being able to execute. So overall, keep it sim simple, the uh, later planning Yes, there's a lower yield uh, potential, but it offers a greater likelihood of, of hitting those doubles and singles than going for the home run. And it requires less management and expense uh, to do that. And so uh, really think about uh, hitting those or getting a, a 180, 200 and not shooting for that 240 bushel yield, uh, at least the first couple of years while you're learning. And, and maybe in some fields you shoot for that, but overall, finding that, that sweet spot of where the management expenses meet the, the highest ROI. Thank you, Bryce. I do want to open it up to any questions uh, that we have from the audience. So we'll just take a second here. If anybody has any questions on corn, feel free to raise your hand uh, or to ask in the chat or, chat or Q and A sections. Okay, looks like we've we've gotten that. So we're going to move on to organic soybeans, and uh, organic soybeans is one of those crops where uh, it's it's we found it to be challenging in many situations in an area where we continue to work to understand how we can refine and identify best practices so that it can become a common part and a regular part of an organic rotation that delivers both profitability from. Uh, the ability to raise uh, adequate yield, adequate to higher yields, and manage your costs successfully. And so this next section, we're going to go through a few examples of, of what we're seeing, one more of a traditional plan, and then a few other examples uh, that incorporate rye into soybeans. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ken Jenkins. Ken, do you want to introduce yourself and then talk through your farm? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, as Steve mentioned, my name is Ken Jenkins. I'm an account executive that covers the eastern uh, half of the Midwest, and I'm also an owner-operator of Goliath Ag Farms in North Central Iowa. And so today, we're, I kind of want to just discuss the unicorn of the organic crops, which is uh, organic soybeans. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are looking at that picture and wondering where are the soybeans or why are you guys talking about this, given this as an example, but um, there's a couple of things going on. One is that the power of the network is so important to us and being able to rely on everybody else's learnings and feedback. And uh, sometimes there's bad that goes with these things and we got to all learn from them 
and I don't want to be embarrassed by it, but we can explain the different things that went went wrong. And so if we look at the planting population, we have the planting population of about 170,000 uh, seeds per acre. Uh, we're growing a Legends 2580. This is based on a contract, so we didn't have choice in the selection of our seed, uh, but did have experience with it. Ended up planting this on June 5th. Um, the soil is a silty loam, but there's a lot of Okaboji clays and some uh, heavier clays out there that make this field a challenge for drainage. Um, and it tends to hold water as all the neighboring farms kind of drain through this field before it goes out the other way. So it may not even be the best field to be trying to grow soybeans on. Um, the other thing to point out here is that in our rotation, uh, this field used to be split into multiple fields. And part of our, our problem on our farm is that the efficiency um, of this organic farm that I took over needs needed to consolidate the fields. And so we're, we're going from about 17 fields down to about seven. So that should help with efficiency and timing significantly. Uh, the last thing to point out there is that, that was a 40, our, our yield is we're, we're aiming for 40 bushels and it is uh, contracted and it's a food grade soybean. So then um, this first picture I'll, I'll kind of show you is uh, for June 16th. Um, at this point, we had three harrow passes after planting up to here. Uh, we did have multiple passes prior to even planting just to try to keep the field as clean as possible. Uh, we had really great control of weeds uh, for the most, for the better half of the beginning of the part of the year. Um, the fields, we did get a couple heavy rains and, and fought with some dry spells and couldn't really tell if, if we needed to go harder or less. Um, but one thing that we learned is that one of those, those three harrow passes that we made uh, with the rotary hoe pass, we would have been better off for it. And that we saw on the fields that had more rotary hill passes, we ended up having cleaner fields and better control throughout the whole season. Um, I think it was just a difference of opinion as to what an R farm we thought did better uh, as far as controlling the weeds. But if we go to the next one, you can see on July 1st, uh, the thing that we have going on here is that we had some rains that kept us out. We got about a good two and a half, three inches of rain that actually kept us out of the fields for a while. We did have a rotary hoe pass. Um, this is actually making a cultivator pass, I, I realized. Um, you can see it's cleaning up very well, uh, but there is at least a good week and a half in between. Um, and then we followed it up again on July 3rd with another cultivation pass, just going the other way to try and clean things up. Uh, one thing that we did notice though, is that the, again, as I mentioned, that the fields that got the rotary hoe passes uh, ended up cleaning up better and didn't need the second cultivation pass uh, immediately after or as quick as after as the other ones did. Um, but if we go to this, this last picture and images, uh, the main lesson is that we kind of got complicit early on in the season. We were really aggressive and then we started to get a dry spell and kind of backed off because um, we were worried that we were going to just dry out our soils completely and everything was going to go the other way when in fact, uh, instead of waiting for the rain to pass and, and then making a cultivation pass, we should have been out there aggressively trying to beat every single rain. It's just, you, as we all know, the weather changes. Um, and the forecast kept getting pushed back and, and it bit us in the butt. So the lesson there is we need to be more aggressive. The other thing to point out here is it's really kind of hard to tell, but on that image on the left side, you can see that the soybeans are growing. There's no, the weeds actually aren't growing in between the soybean plants or they're growing in a perfect line along the soybeans. And the interesting part about that is that the picture prior to the, or the, the time I was out visiting the field prior to this picture, uh, that row of weeds was on the other side of the plant. So basically we have a setup wrong within our cultivator. We're not throwing enough dirt. We're not maybe getting uh, a big enough sweep across all of it. So uh, that's something that we definitely got to look at. We, that's something that should have been set and looked at in the field and taken care of early on. So as you're making your passes, be be uh, able to get out, walk around, make sure it's doing what you need to do. If you need to reset, uh, reset your equipment and make sure that you're getting the kind of coverage that you need. Uh, 
because at this point now we'll have to wait for for a good freeze and just to make it easier to combine and clean this stuff out and uh to make sure that we hit our specs we'll probably have to add a cleaning pad or a, a seed cleaning in there so then if we go to the budget uh the one thing that we were trying to do here was eliminate walking costs and eliminate some other costs and again you know sometimes uh like i said swimming through the unicorn uh so you really have to be more aggressive you have to spend uh, probably a little bit more time and attention, if not double the time and attention as you would have to rake in corn. Um, the things I want to highlight here is that you can tell at the very beginning, we made several passes before we ended up making our first planting. Um, you can see the difference in the cost there is that the cost where it's a little bit lower, that's our cost. That's what our farm factors our cost in, and that we, we track through our my farm system. Um, but you see that $15 cost, that's actually the, the rate. We actually paid someone to do the cult, field cultivating and the planting for us this year. Uh, they just had a better planter for the, the size of beans that we were planting and it did a great, a great job. Um, the other thing we got to note there is that we had to get a third party affidavit for those since it was somebody else doing the work on our farm. A um, couple rain events uh, later on in the season ended up spacing out our time. We went from that uh, every three to four day pass, making a pass to, you know, about every oh, six to 10 days, we started making a pass. Um, when realistically, that's when we needed to be more aggressive. We should have been out there more often, really trying to get ahead of those things. Um, when we made that pass, we should have seen the grasses and been able to make the pass again, go in the opposite direction and hopefully try to clean that up. Um, total cost excluding the rent is about $294. Uh, like I mentioned, this is a food grade seed contract, so our soybeans are contracted at $23 a bushel. We still think we're going to get the 40 bushels, which, you know, should generate around 920 bucks an acre. Uh, I did the math. Even if we got 20 bushels, uh, that would still be $460 an acre. And the overall return still leaves us with about 166 if we got 20 bushels, but um, since we're going for that 40 bushels, we're hoping to still have about $626 left over, and then we can pay our land rent with that and still have enough money to hopefully make up for some of the mistakes we made. Um, but the major thing that we've got to think about here is now, is that field of fit for soybeans? Uh, is that is there something different that we can grow on those fields? with the soybeans um, is there's just a lot of factors that we gotta we're gonna have to come up with and make sure that we start planning for now versus waiting for the for uh, the winter we want to figure out those plans now and and make sure that we're fully prepared thank you Ken and thank you for uh, sharing an example of uh, how challenging soybeans can be uh, unfortunately through our network we know that that's often the case uh, and so it's 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 something that as a community we continue need to continue to work on. So thank you for that. And we got a number of different questions. So uh, two of them a little bit related to I think tied into rotation. One was about you know, your rotation overall, and, and based upon the first setup slide, it, it didn't look like you had uh, three or four crop crops in your rotation. So do you want to talk just about your rotation in general, what you're looking at from a long-term rotation and then in this field specifically uh, do you think you'll push it into corn next year or because of your experience this year with with soybeans will it change your thinking about what you want to do in this field uh, for next year yeah those are all great questions and so to just kind of start out how i said i i mentioned that Earlier on, when we took over this organic farm, what we identified as a major problem and challenge was that we had a lot of fields that were about 20 acre sizes. And um, so that, that was from an efficiency standpoint, it really slowed us down and killed us. So what we did is we're trying to take all of those fields and uh, consolidate them to more reasonable size farms. So this one uh, originally had two 20 acre pieces uh, that, uh, eventually have been consolidated and there's actually a third piece that's still in conventional that will eventually will also get transitioned and lined up in the rotation to match this and so then basically this south farm will have two fields instead of 
four fields. And so um, the alfalfa that was used during transition was many years ago and it was poorly done. Um, and kind of a weedy mess too, didn't really get very well established when they did it. So that kind of set us up for a challenge on that. Um, as far as what we'll do next year, we still have to kind of go back and look at the bigger picture because it's not just this field that we have to factor into the process. It's about making sure that our acres are balanced across. And that's both from a, a work standpoint, making sure that we can get across all our corn acres, but also from an economic standpoint, I don't want to uh, suddenly watch my revenue drop out from underneath us because we're taking so many acres out that we were really relying on to keep us balanced. So there's a lot that we still have yet to figure out. Ideally, we'd like to have uh, another small grain in the mix, something that does better than our oats did really well this year on that on that uh, other half of that field. But, you know, if, if we can bring in some rye or some barley or something else that's a small grain that will help choke out those weeds, ideally we'd like to be in the going from a small grain to corn back to soybeans. Um, for us, we'll always take on soybeans because as I showed with those economics, uh, you know, we probably should have spent more money to protect a lot more of that crop, uh, but it's worth figuring out just on the price point there um, and, and the options that we have as far as seller, uh, who we can sell to in our area. And then there's a question around crop insurance, and it was basically what kind of crop insurance did you use uh, for the uh, soybean field? Yeah, so we have 85% uh, coverage on our soybean field. So uh, I can't remember what the APH is or anything like that. Um, Bryce, do you want Bryce, to add on? That, yeah, yeah. So it's multi peril crop insurance, uh, which is common for corn and soybeans in the organic world. Once you get into small grains, there's small grains off off and the, the off crops, there's m many more options. And there's Bryce, while you're on. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Amy. Oh, I was just going to say there are also options. You can do production hail or there's private products for um, hail and wind that um, just pay on damage. So there's a variety of different options available. Generally, when you enter in and do organics or transition, um, you unfortunately have to forego your personal um, lands APH and then you get um, you get kind of county county APHs for transition and organic, which are generally considerably lower. And then over time, you're replacing those yields to get your own average. That's right. And that's one of the things that with, with organic corn and organic soybeans, uh, you know, there's a well-established uh, crop insurance opportunity. As Amy mentioned, you have to rebuild your APHs uh, when you get into organics. Um, so that's one of the challenges, but with some of the other crops, and we're happy to talk about this offline with folks, uh, there may not be uh, the similar or same type of uh, crop insurance options, depending on the, the region you live in and what the crop history has uh, been recently. Um, if I would add just one quick comment to that, that while the APH for organic starting out may be lower, the strike price is considerably higher than the international farming strike price. When farmers typically go to the field in organics, they have a much higher level of revenue coverage in organics than what they have in conventional farming. That, that, that's a great point, Pete. Thanks. Um, and then we had uh, one other question that uh, uh, even, even with the mistakes, it seems like this field will be profitable. Why don't more folks go uh, into organic with such potential? And, and Bryce, maybe do you want to touch upon that and also some of the, the long-term impact of uh, not having ideal weed management? Yeah, so I mean, the, the major reason is, is why people don't enter organic is all the unknowns. Uh, you know, it's a, and when you start to get into it, there's, there's quite a few of it. Where do you market? Where do you get nutrients? What type of rotation? What are the markets? I mean, we can, we can sit here all day and, and go through the unknowns that just aren't at the fingertips such as conventional. And so I'd say the, the biggest uh, reason people don't go organic is they, they just don't know what, what it means or what it entails or how to go about it. 
and that's what we see with a lot of customers that start with us is being able to bring a, a considerable amount of those unknowns and have the answers for them, uh, as well as the workload management, uh, time commitment. Those are all things that uh, are aspects you have to consider before you go organic uh, that uh, ha have potential impact. So number one, the unknowns. Number two, the, the workload and management that's required to do organic. Thank you, Bryce. Hey, Bryce can I just chime in real quick with that? Uh, how about we come come back to come back to it generally, uh, Ken? One comment, and then I do want to keep us moving forward, uh, so we stay close yeah. to on time. Yep. And just the one thing is that we're still waiting on the yield, um, to, and we got to hit that yield. But if it was food grade soybeans and we only got 20 bushels, that's only going to leave us $86, and my rent is far more than $86. So there's still a lot of risk, and there's still a lot of unknowns with that. So this still could potentially. Uh, not in the way that we wanted. Thanks, Ken. So we saw an example of soybeans grown alone in a field, and we've talked about the need for looking at uh, other approaches to soybeans that might be more productive in terms of both yield potential, but also being able to manage wheat. And one opportunity we have in transition is to use transition or in organics is to use transition fields as an opportunity to experiment. And Ken's going to talk a little bit about one of his members who's using that opportunity with rye and soybeans. Ken. Thanks, Steve. And if you participated last week, uh, you probably got to hear some of this in a little bit more in depth, but just to touch base, Jamie uh, farms with an, another couple guys up in Northeast Iowa. Um, they share equipment, they share knowledge, and they share labor, and it kind of works out great for all of them. So it's a network within a network. Um, and so what they did is that they needed to find a better way to, to make that second year transition that was a little bit more profitable because they don't have alfalfa as a market. So one of the things that they thought was, why don't we plant some uh, rye? Because they did some on the conventional side. They felt like they got a good knowledge of it. Um, but before they start roll crimping it, they needed to to build up that experience and knowledge a little bit more. So they planted rye um, last November, and then they waited until about May 10th, that normal planting time for soybeans, planted their soybeans directly into a standing rye crop. They'll take it to both crops to harvest. Um, the things that they noted that they really liked early on was that the soil erosion was a good control when they got a heavy rain, um, big wind events. They didn't really see any soil erosion that they typically would have. Weed control was really good. They still had a couple of escapes as far as water hip, but for the most part, it really did a good job of controlling those weeds um, early on. One of the reasons that they would have liked to have gotten their rye planted earlier than November, like that September timeframe is to help space out some things. And one of those is that they uh, compete for moisture and nutrients early on in the season. So, if the rye would have been a little bit more established, it would have been a little bit bigger. It may not have needed as much uh, moisture at the time that, and taken as much up and robbed it from the, the soybeans. Because if this was an organic crop, the soybeans are going to be worth more. So that's what their, their idea is, is, learning and building as if this was organic. Uh, the other thing is that they, they, like I mentioned, they've had experience with this uh, on the conventional side where they could have, if they made a mistake, they could have uh, caught back up and, and corrected it. Um, so they just they're 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 not doing this across all the board. They're they're learning on, on by taking steps incrementally. And so then if we look, <laughs> we move forward to July third. Uh, we're getting closer to harvest time. And how they made this or how they planted this field is that they plugged every third or every every fourth row on the drill so that they can plant and they could leave a perfect row for their soybeans to come in and plant into later. And so they had really good weed control as mentioned. Um, but one of the things that becomes a challenge is that at harvest time, the moisture, uh, the rye is a lot like soybeans. They have to hit a certain spec to, uh, to take it in and they don't have the, the storage. And so the rye, takes on some of that moisture. So it left them to a window where they were basically not able to harvest until about one o'clock in the afternoon. And about nine o'clock, they can see the moisture starting to rise in the rye again. So they'd have to shut it down. Um, and that the big challenge that goes with that is that 
as they're taking the rye harvest, uh, uh, as they're harvesting the rye, it's making the rye harvest take more days. The soybeans are gonna continue to grow. They're starting to catch up, so they have to move the head, header up. So they're not damaging the soybeans. And so they're taking less of the rye the further on that this goes. And so the big challenge there is this isn't something that they can do across all their acres. So this is just a great way for them to use in their second year transition as they learn and continue to push to, to, uh, to the roll crimping method. Yeah. Uh, I think that this one has a lot of promise. I think that there's, um, there's a lot of hope for this, but there's still a lot of unknowns. We had great uh, conditions this year for growing. Uh, small grains in general, uh, but we'll we'll have to wait and see. Uh, they're still hoping for 40 bushel beans, and if that's the case, and they can they can master the roll crimping, uh, these guys will be onto something, and and uh, we'll do a really good job controlling their weed. Thanks, thanks, Ken. We got one question kind of related to this, but I'm going to pass it over to Bryce because uh, he has intercropping more more generally on his farm. The question is, when you get into intercrafting, uh, it may not qualify for insurance. So, you know, how do you think about uh, that uh, and incorporate it into kind of your risk management plan for your farm? Yeah, so it's a, it's a very good question. And with a lot of these things we're talking about, uh, double check with your crop insurance agent first before you do them. Because he's exactly right. The, these aren't uh, practices that are widely accepted uh, on the uh, insurance world. And so, what you cannot, as, us, as far as I know, you cannot insure double cropping uh, with multi peril through uh, uh, an agent. I did about 500 acres of peas and canola this year to uh, intercrop and intercrop. And what I did for insurance is there's a cap policy you can do uh, through the USDA. And so I took cap policies out on all my uh, intercropping and it's not really good insurance, but it's something. And for us, the, the size and scale of our acres, 500 acres of peas and canola was a small portion of revenue. And it's something we had to do to get in a rotation. And, and so, Yes, yeah, so we didn't get the greatest insurance on it, but uh, the rest of the insurance I look at as a whole farm type of insurance. And so I take out multi peril I take out whole farm. I really insure my look at a whole farm, how much I'm going to spend on that farm to how much revenue is going to be g generated and what my costs are as a whole farm basis, not on a field by field basis. And I'm still able, able to cover most of my risk with all the other insurance products that I've had and able to use and not have the greatest insurance on my intercropping, but there is a cap policy through the USDA. And so one thing I would add on to that, uh, and Bryce mentioned this, check with your crop insurance agent. Uh, if you're in organics, I'm sure you found a crop insurance agent that understands organic crop insurance. There are some nuances that are, that are really important. If you have an agent or you find that your agent uh, isn't willing to do the research and the heavy lifting to understand what works in, in organics, we'd recommend that you look for an agent who is knowledgeable because that does make a uh, significant difference uh, in kind of the planning and the risk management for your operation. With that, we're going to pass uh, headed into another example of intercrop or, or organic soybeans and rye. Uh, and Bryce, you want to take it away? Yeah, so this is uh, a grower that I work with in Illinois, uh, and his work has really, really proven to me that I, I think uh, rye is very viable to roll uh, and do organic soybeans in certain fields with uh, certain management levels. Uh, but this is an end in Illinois. It's two, he planted 200,000 uh, population of a Beck's Great Harvest, uh, planted April 22nd, coming after organic corn, uh, 50 bushels and he planted it and then rolled it so we'll get into it a little bit but uh, he's been doing this for five years had a, a bunch of learning experiences and if we look through his fields here this is in May he'll plant soybeans and then come back and roll them so planted April 22nd uh, he'll come back and roll it he drilled the rye at three bushels planted April 22nd April 23rd and rolled the rye May 19th and as you can see on this May 16th here, uh, he, he's hit the stages to roll rye. 
soybeans are growing under it and he's able to come in and roll it and have the, the soybeans already started on their growth and get those early soybeans in to get the, the most growth potential. And he has learned to roll at a diagonal. Uh, he's not sure if that's the exact correct way, but that's the way he does it. He, he might switch up and do, do it different ways next year to learn where, which way he gets the better kill. And so if we look at June 6th here, 2020, soybeans are emerging through the rye. He planted, uh, again, 200,000. He thinks he's at 130 to 150,000, so that higher planting population is critical. Uh, looking at his fields, he has pretty effective weed control. Uh, there's a few issues being flat ground in Illinois, having some rain early on that you have to consider is, is those drowned out spots, what do you do with them? You can't just leave them, and it's really hard to get in there and manage them. So he did have a few spots that were drowned out that will have a few weeds in it. But uh, overall, if you look at his field now, uh, and I haven't been out there, he just we've talked on the phone. Uh, he's very happy, just as clean as conventional, conventional fields, but uh, very happy with it. And, and Bryce, did you touch upon the planting rate? Uh... Yep. Okay. Yeah. So if we look. Uh, Yes, Steve, we did. 200, okay. He planted 200,000 and 130 to 150,000 was the final stand. So that, that planting is very critical to keep it up there. If I were doing it, I'd even jump up to 250,000. So one of the big things that we like to do at AgriScare and, and, and as well as each farmer is understand when we're making changes, what's the economic impact of those changes and, and what am I gaining by doing it? And so as we have traditional soybeans with all the tillage and time and effort into them, why do I change to uh, no-till rye other than the environment, environmental uh, impact and benefits that could possibly come from it? We still got to understand what's the bottom line. And so if we look through this and we diligently put together his cost, uh, true cost of doing each, each operation. And so we look at a disking, he vertical tilled it twice and planted rye. Uh, he's a little bit farther south than a lot of people, so late planting rye is not a big issue for him. Uh, he came in and planted April 22nd. Uh, very high cost of soybeans due to the food grade and his uh, uh, population level. He actually roller crimped it on 519 at 743 an acre. We put in $80 for manual weeding labor. I think he'll be under that. Uh, he'll do a fungicide. He has done a fungicide and insecticide, uh, crop insurance, harvesting, truck hauling, and organic paperwork. So we figured his cost about $483 an acre. And I won't go through every cost on the other side, but this was where he started when he had traditional organic soybeans. And we figured his cost about $526 an acre. One of the big things is he could not control weeds in the row very well. And so we have $160, which is probably even cheap on that. He is uh, more in that $200, $250 range for weed control and organic soybeans. And so we can see there is a significant difference in cost of doing this if we can keep the yield same and the revenues same or, or better. And so one of the things when we, when I see organic people do a lot of experimentation is, is it, it never correlates back to the economic impact of what's going on in the field. And that's one of the big things we we go out there and and I can say I do it too. We, we experiment a lot of, with a lot of things, but we never understand exactly how it's going to impact the farm, both environmentally and and economically. And so keeping track of this and understanding why we're doing things not only helps the bottom line, but helps you focus in on what you're doing and why you're doing it and to be successful at it. And so, Bryce, we had one question from early on around rye and soybeans where the question was, uh, have you seen where uh, rye that's too tall can affect, uh, affect planting soybeans? And, uh, or for example, if you crimp taller rye before planting, the planter may not be able to penetrate the mat of rye and cannot reach the soil properly. Yeah, and so I, I can say I have never seen that issue of getting the planter into the ground when you have tall rye. It's actually what, I, what I've been told uh, by the producers I work with that do this. It's actually it, almost easier to get it into the ground because you have those living roots growing and, and uh, opening up that soil. You're not seeing a, any harder compact layer. So 
most times when I'm hearing it's actually easier to get into the ground if it's living. Uh, when, when you roll the rye before planting, I've never seen somebody roll it and then come back a couple weeks later and plant it, so I can't comment on that. But rolling and planting at the same day has the same effects. And so I have not seen issues uh, penetrating the soil with a planter uh, into rye. I've actually, from what I've been told and understand, it's actually easier. And one of the things you have to do is lighten up the, the down pressure. Thank you, Brian. But, but all soils are not the same, and I don't work uh, with every soil in the world. And so just keep that in mind that uh, different soils react differently. And I, and I know the question came from Minnesota, and I, I honestly don't have a lot of, of experience with Minnesota soils. So it, it could vary region to region. Thank you. That's what makes organics and what we do so fun. We get to continue to learn all the time. Uh, any other questions about uh, soybeans before I move on to the next section of, of, of today's agenda? No, and I see there's a few other questions out there that I think we'll get to at the end. So uh, just generally more about organic markets. So we'll, uh, for those of you who asked those, we'll get to those in a bit. Bryce, you want to bring it home on soybeans? Yep, I will. So as you, as, you, as we went through these presentations, I, I think you've seen that uh, soybeans, and we didn't want to portray them as easy or, or uh, um, that they're a crop that can be done lightly. Uh, through learning at AgriSkier, they're very, very difficult, uh, especially at scale. So one of the things that we we really want to convey is to select the number of acres based upon management capability and capacity uh, and potential and fields with potential for success. And so we have growers that will, if their rotation was corn soybeans, would have soybeans come up and they'll split the soybeans and do half, half soybeans on those acres and half small grains just to be able to manage those soybeans better on half the acres they, they did corn on. And so thinking through those are really going to enhance your success uh, going further into the, into the organic production. Uh, successful soybean start years prior to planting, good weed control, good fertility management, not having a lot of excess nitrogen out there when you're going to plant soybeans, uh, those type of things, cover crops, uh, managing the, the free nitrogen on top of the soil, those all start before you even plant soybeans and need to be highly planned and considered. What we feel is no-till no soybeans have a promise. Uh, rotation is one of the limiting factors to no-till soybeans for a lot of us. And refining and trialing different factors of when to plant, when to roll, how much to plant, do you crisscross plant rye, do you do three bushels, two bushels, what kind of rye do we use? All those things uh, are being studied right now, and there's, there's a few answers on them, uh, but they change farm to farm, and understanding those practices that are best for your farm it is uh, the keys to success. And so actually on our farm, we feel comfortable enough. I've never raised organic soybeans on our farm. I don't want to manage them. I don't want all the tillage that goes with them. Uh, and they just don't fit into our rotation. But now understanding no-till uh, and understanding how we have to do it, having a small grain, having rye planted early, I feel comfortable doing quite considerable amounts of acres of soybeans next year, no-till soybeans. and uh, have a high, high degree of confidence and success of that if it's done right. Um, and, and so thinking through those no-till soybeans uh, can be challenging, but uh, we think there's potential there. Later planted soybeans, if you're not doing no-till, uh, increase the chance of success in weed management. And so what I look at, at least the west central Iowa and north, is Planting soybeans after May 30th uh, severely redu or significantly reduces the, the weed pressure uh, on most fields. And so I would strongly suggest if, if you, you can do early planted soybeans, but uh, time them out with late planted soybeans to, to learn. And in most years, you're not going to see too significant of yield decrease compared to weed control, tillage, and all the management that you have to do with the earlier planted soybeans. And so, Bryce. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just to say we had a few other questions or comments come up uh, on the soybeans and rye while you were wrapping up. Do we want to take those now? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. 
Sure. What, so one was, what is the depth of soybeans planted into rye? Yeah, so we're we're trying to hit oh about an inch on those, I believe, is what the, the producers that I'm working with um, to get them up out of the ground a little bit sooner. So a, a, an inch to half inch is, is, I believe, what they're planting at um, okay. without diving deep and, and asking more questions to them. So. And then there's a the question about rye and uh, volunteer uh, rye carrying over to the next season. How big of a concern is that? Um, and what have you seen uh, done to manage that? Yeah, so this is one of the things that uh, is very important and I appreciate the question. It's one of the, one of the things that I've seen many people make mistakes getting really complicated on cover crops. Uh, not only rolling rye into soybeans, but just having rye in your field. And I did it this year. I had a great barley field with a lot of rye in it. And so understanding how cover crops not only affect you this, this year one, but year two is very important. And starting off with winter killed cover crops can can save you a lot of money while you're learning. Uh, and you might be very experienced with cover crops and conventional, but it's pretty easy when you can kill them with the with a herbicide and in organic, you can't do that. And so starting off, or starting off with winter till cover crops is something I strongly urge. Uh, but as far as getting rye, raising rye, once you have rye in a field, you'll have it for quite some time. And so food grade, barley, food grade, wheat, food grade, uh, small grains are really, really tough to do if you have rye in that field prior. Uh, getting rye into those types of, of, of uh, Food grade, small grains will inhibit you from going to the food grade markets for the most part. Now, if you're planning on doing feed grade, uh, small grains, they don't, they are not as picky currently this year, you know, I'm not saying things don't change, but uh, they're not as picky when you do those food grade type of, uh, or feed grade production on small grains. Perfect. Thank you, Bryce. So, before I move on to the next section, just one call out. This year, AgriSecure did a series of videos uh, from B&B Earlbex Farms covering on alfalfa, intercropping of organic uh, peas and canola, or and organic corn. Those are all up on YouTube. Uh, so if you'd like to see and hear from Bryce and Amy and myself, uh, feel free to, we, I'd encourage you to go to YouTube and search for AgriSecure. While you're there, if you'd follow us, that'd be fantastic. The other thing is that we're continuing to ramp up uh, our social media sharing of information that we think is relevant uh, and interesting, uh, including uh, examples from our network's uh, fields. So if you follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram, you can kind of keep up to date on what's going on with AgriSecure. Now we'll transition into equipment, talking through both some of the, the foundational elements of equipment and what's needed, uh, as well as some of the optional tools and their efficacy and, and what might be on the horizon. So Bryce, do you want to kick us off here? Yeah. So getting the foundation built is one of the, the other keys to success, and it, it can be daunting task. Um, you know, thinking of that pre-planting through canopy, what tools do I need? What tools do I need to be proactive? Uh, how many of those certain tools do I need uh, to, to get across my acres? Uh, how do I set those up? Uh, I can tell you a lot of the people that know how to set these tools, specifically the cultivator, are, are getting, getting pretty aged now. Um, I, I, my dad remembers, but he, he is not by any any uh, measure experience with doing it. And so it's a learning curve to do all these and understand what I need uh, to, to be successful. And, and without having somebody there to help you and think through it with you, it's really a trial uh, type of measure to, to get it right. And, and still with somebody to help you, it's still a trial to get those right. But very important, especially to start off on a good foot in organic or transition to have the correct tools, the correct uh, amount of tools, and and also to make sure we're not overspending on those. Because uh, you can start spending on, on equipment, as all farmers like to do, and rack up a pretty good bill. Um, thinking about the frequency you're going to use the tools, the adaptability to use them in different uh, different environments, so the tine weeder, 
We use it in small grains. We use it in corn and soybeans. Uh, we use it in planting cover crops. And so thinking of all the adaptability and then how, how aggressive do you need to be and what type of soils do you have? Uh, just an example, I have a lot of people that will buy things with, without asking, should, should we do this? And, you know, some soils work for some type of cultivators. Uh, some attachments for cultivators work for, for some type of soils and, and some don't. And so understanding all those things can be a key to building the foundation for organic success with, within the equipment realm. So we'll, yep. And now I'll pass it to Amy. Uh, with our rotation, we don't have a need for a, a row crop flamer, but Amy out in Nebraska has been utilizing it the last couple of years, and she has a lot more knowledge than I do on it. Okay, thank you, Bryce. Appreciate it. Um, all right, on flamer, it is an effective weed management tool. There are different versions of it. There's some do-it-yourself versions all the way to, you know, the University of Nebraska has created one as well. And that's shown in the upper right-hand corner, the AFI model. Um, each crop does have specific burn windows. So you really got to be careful and knowledgeable on when to leverage this technology. I like it. I don't plan rotations around um, the flamer. Some people do, but uh, the way in which I leverage it is coming out of a rainstorm. If it's been several days um, that I haven't been able to do my normal weed management passes, I, I uh, then deploy this because you can travel in wet fields. You just can't travel when the plants are wet. So you have to wait till the morning dews off or the rain's off. Um, because the rain will kind of act as an insulator and will not cause the effect that you're looking for. So basically what it does, it's about 1200 degrees um, of heat. And instead of burning the actual weeds, it, it essentially um, explodes a cell. So if you can see the picture on the top left, that's um, a weed that just uh, recently had the uh, flamer pass over it. Um, you can see my fingerprint there. That is an indication that that weed is pretty much uh, going to be dying. Um, you know, same with um, conventional methods of, of uh, trying to tackle weeds. Taller weeds are more challenging. So again, if you can get out there and do this application, um, basically like three inch, uh, three inch weeds or less, you're gonna have a lot more effectiveness on your um, kill. Um, you know, if you can broadcast, use this, but I find it more effective really to do it in a banding form um, because you're targeting those weeds that maybe you're, uh, the weeds that are established that you can no longer get with any of your other tools. Um, if the weeds are small, you need less gallons um, of propane, four to five. I think propane costs are, you know, 80 to 90 cents or they, they uh, were this summer earlier on in the summer. So, you know, pretty cost effective way to uh, do your weed management. It tends to be more effective on your broadleafs than your grasses. And uh, you do get a setback on grasses. And that's one more reason why um, you should go out there and cultivate soon after, you know, within the next two days, just to bury whatever you did injure. Um, you know, some things don't come back again those, on those broad leaves. Water hemp's a really good one, and and velvet leaf are are really good uh, weeds that that tend to die by using this application. But you know, some some are just really challenging to uh, kill. Cocklebur, uh, wild sunflower, palmer, they all get injured, and that's another reason why to do that um, last cultivation pass um, and cover what you did injure. But it's it's a it's a good tool, um, and there. If you have any more questions, please definitely reach out about this. One of the other tools that we have been experimenting with uh, on a few of our farms is the Optimal Guidance. Um, this is an Einback tool, and there's other people that make it. But uh, we've, we've seen good success with using this tool and, and being effective. Uh, it improves accuracy and precision and it reduces the fatigue, but re lowers the skill requirement to go out and cultivate, especially on curves and hills and things like that. Uh, and we've seen it on hillsides up in Northeast Nebraska stay on them and, and be pretty good. It is an expensive tool. So 
acreage consideration of how much you're going to run it through is important, but it is a it is a tool that we are experimenting with, understanding and and seeing success with it. Um, moving on to weed zappers, um, it's actually I would consider this kind of an emerging technology. There are initial prototypes out there. It's been around for a few years. Um, I purchased one for our farm last year. Uh, it definitely shows promise. So the main application with this is really to fight those weeds that have emerged above canopy, typically in um, in your soybeans. So you know you can weigh out the cost of sending walkers in or deploying your your capital into uh, technology. Um, you know it's it's a it's a tough game when those weeds are above canopy, and it, it's a yeah. This is one way to to go after them the investment is high um we trialed well we purchased a 40 foot um 40 foot weed zapper and uh you know you're we've also used a front mount hitch so we could definitely put that right above the crop canopy and try to target those weeds you don't want this to touch your canopy um at all because it can lead to um damage to your crops so it it uh, it is effective to weed escapes. You know you, you need to have the generator requirements on this requires a large uh, or a high amount of horsepower on your tractor. So for a for a 40 foot, you needed north of um, 300 horsepower to run it. But yeah, as as time goes on, there's going to be more and more um, applications and innovations out there. And kind of moving on to the next slide, you know in Basically, I, I do feel like there's somewhat of a misconception with organics that it's very low technology. But, you know, in the previous slides that we discussed and some of the pictures here that you can see, um, it really, there is a different story. Um, there, there are a lot of things you can balance technology and getting results into your fields. Um, an additional item on the top left, and this is something we trialed at our own field with Sabatno Ag, is an autonomous operating system. Essentially, we they deploy the brains and uh, attach the brains, so the guidance system to Kubota tractors that are small because they can haul them around on uh, just with a pickup and a trailer. Um, they've done trials in planting this year and also back-to-back um, -back cultivation trials on a 100-acre field. And uh, this, this application above was with a rotary hoe, a 20-foot rotary hoe. So we um, gave gave uh, spot no ag our RTK maps and they downloaded those in the system and then they deployed the machine and away away it goes so you know it's it's something that um, that is potentially coming and uh, you know it was it was pretty highly effective so you know just kind of staying in tune with with what's coming down the pipeline is pretty exciting um, another uh, another picture on the side, there's there's various uh, companies experimenting with robotic technology at this point. Um, you know, I, it, it, I, there's a lot of companies out there that are generating ideas to support organic farming, and it's a pretty exciting sector to be in right at this moment. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we work with. Thank you, Amy. And that's one of the things that we work with our members on is one, where Bryce started, what's the foundation? What are the key tools that you need to have on your operation? How do you make sure that you have enough capacity uh, with the tools that you have to get through the field? And then as your operation grows or you gain experience, what are the tools that are out there that you can add in that can be used as needed and really drive a strong ROI uh, for the investment you have in them? And then also continuing to test and understand what's happening as technology emerges. And organics does provide a great opportunity for a lot of technologies such as weed zappers or uh, robotics and autonomous uh, vehicles because when your corn is trading at a two to three times premium, the value of, of, of doing that or when you have more operations that you need to get to the field that ROI can come fairly quickly uh, or more quickly than potentially in conventional. And so we're always watching out for those, trying to learn about them, and then over time uh, integrating them into farming operations as it makes sense and where you're going to get that strong return on your investment. 
So with that, we're, we're coming down the home stretch here. We want to talk a little bit about long-term crop rotations. So today we focused on, on corn and soybeans. We touched upon uh, rotations a little bit throughout the discussion. One of the things that we believe is that, you know, to thrive in a lower price market, what are the keys? So you can see in this top chart that, you know, corn has come down to that seven or sub seven dollar range for organics after trading kind of in the eight fifty to nine fifty dollar range for a number of years. Soybeans continue to be strong. Um, but what are the things that are going to differentiate you and allow you to continue to excel uh, and be profitable um, as an organic operation. And one of the keys we believe is having a long-term rotation that sets you up for success by managing the risks uh, and continuing to improve your weed management practices and soil health and fertility. And, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Bryce to just talk a little bit about how we see balancing these key elements in your operation and how rotations come into it. Thank you, Steve. And so how we look at rotations, which I, I believe is the most important part of being successful in organic, the, the foundation of, of thinking through rotations and understanding why some are successful and why some aren't. Uh, and how we do that is break it down into the economics, the management, and the agronomics. And these do not stay, stay the same importance each year. Uh, when we first started out transitioning, economics were the most important part, uh, a bigger part of, of the decision. Uh, as we get further into organic, uh, I can we move to management. Uh, we don't like working seven days a week, 12-hour uh, days. And so figuring out how to lower that management and time we have to spend on the farm has became really important uh, in the middle stage. And now we're really moving to, to the agronomics. So after five years, our focus is not so much economics. We've built a good base. Uh, we, we understand what we want to, to achieve in the profitability. We understand the management, the rotation now of, of what we're going to do. And now we're really fi figuring out the agronomics of lowering that cost of production, getting better crops, uh, entering different markets where those crops can grow, their agronomic activity. And so that, this, this picture of this is economic management and agronomics do not, do not stay the same. They're going to change and evolve each year. It's just understanding where you're at and what you're working on and where you want to end up is the most important uh, aspect of this. And, and Bryce, one thing I'd add into that is that, you know, when, you, when you're focusing on the agronomics, uh, you know, our belief is that if you're getting that right, that really does help support the management and uh, economic goals that you have. Uh, you know, all three are critical, but the agronomics can, can help set you up for success in the other dimensions as well. Yes, yep. So looking at a few of the long-term rotations, uh, this is one of the ones that's not the quite the bare minimum, but uh, it's one of the bare minimums that we would consider. The actual organic kind of standard is corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans in a small grain every fifth year. Uh, and that changes by certifier, but uh, this is one of the bare minimums we would recommend as a corn, soybeans, wheat. And even in this, if we look throughout the years, what we're starting to see is decreased revenues from weed pressure, extra, extra economic cost into producing the crop, the nutrients, the, the um, uh, time management and all that through. Throughout the years, we expect the returns to go down even in a, in a three-way rotation. We're not saying this on every farm, but on average, you can expect uh, higher weed, weed pressure, more nutrients to go into the system and more passes throughout the field as you get uh, through uh, further into organic production. And so disadvantages of a rotation that's just corn, soybeans, wheat, uh, wheat suppression will become more difficult over time, more costly, an increased amount of tillage, and not in all cases, but uh, in, if we're looking at it uh, conservatively, deteriorating yield and increased cost, uh, which is never good. The advantages of this does provide advantages in breaking the wheat cycle. Uh, from what I've seen and what I would do on my own farm, it does not break it enough to to uh, bring down the management cost, nutrient cost, and, and management time. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the other advantages that we see is you, after wheat in this rotation, you can provide a very good cover crop, a 
10 species mixed after that wheat comes off in most cases and, and grow quite a few nutrients and, and uh, release nutrients and, and do weed control after that wheat comes off as well. So this is one of the bare minimum type of, and you can replace wheat with any small grain, uh, but uh, bare minimum type of uh, rotation that we would recommend. One of the ones that I'm working on and, and thinking about is this corn, barley, soybeans rotation and thinking about having uh, conventionally tilled corn, going to barley, planting rye after the, after the barley and going to no-till soybeans, uh, I think has a, a potential to be successful and lower the management cost and really utilize the, the different uh, weed control methods that we have. And we see a disadvantage is weed suppression will still become more difficult over time. Uh, you'll Walkers and zappers in this rotation will most likely be required uh, over time, and this is acceptable to disease pressure such as the barley after corn, two grasses carrying the same disease have potential to, to have more disease pressure in that uh, rotation. The advantages before barley after corn, before soybeans, is the, the, you have the opportunity, I think, to be more successful at no-till better workload management, uh, potential for larger scale acres. But again, this is something that we're thinking about of, of looking at and, and uh, keeping track of the financial returns on this, as well as what is the management, uh, what are the management setbacks that could potentially occur on this type of rotation? Uh, so looking over rotation comparison of what we've seen on the data side, as a corn, soybeans, wheat, one-fifth uh, small grain every five years uh, has one of the highest costs with the lowest, uh, lower, not the lowest return, but close to it. And if we break it down in a corn, soybean, small grain, uh, we're looking at lower average variable expenses and a little bit lower return to the land and management. Uh, but the agronomics are better longer-term sustainability than uh, only having small grains once every fifth year. And then looking at a corn, barley, soybeans, uh, not too much change in variable expenses, a little bit less, but uh, a little bit higher average return to management. Uh, so economic good management is medium. And then we look at a corn, barley, soybeans for years of alfalfa. We are cost quite significantly. We're hiring the return on this. And so this is what I'm working for, and not everybody can do alfalfa because the market is there, but uh, understanding wh where you're headed and what you're doing and the, the impacts not only today, but it going into the future are so important. I, on our farm, I know we couldn't control weeds without having three years of alfalfa, but we're not as aggressive with our equipment. We're not in the field as much as some other people are. So it's just, we, we're taking that three years of alfalfa because we have the market and using that as setting our plan up for a really good corn and weed control. Not saying these other things don't work, but thinking about today and how long organic, uh, how long of production you want to stay in organic, and our goal is to be in it for the long term, uh, is having these crops in there to for weed control and rotation and managing all these crops uh, to, to allow you to have the best chance to be in organic for a while. Yeah, so I'd like to just add a few comments, Bryce. One. If you look here at the variable expenses per year, I think that has a real impact on operations as they're looking at, you know, how do I finance my operation uh, and relative to the return that I'm going to expect on my land and management. Uh, so it's one key that we look at. And then with our clients, we really do want to, and, and we think with any organic farmer, you have to think about your long-term rotation and how's it going to set you up for success. Uh, over that long term, and part of that's based upon what is the agronomy going to come from that rotation, how is it going to affect uh, your field, but also what kind of management capability you can have. And so as Bryce mentioned, they're, they're focusing on something where they can incorporate alfalfa because it's an opportunity that has a lot of great impacts there, and then how does that impact their year-to-year um, operations in those other fields uh, for the positive or potentially for the negative. So what we really focus in on, again, is that long-term rotation, thinking through it. Now, it's not a set rotation that's going to persist forever, 
but continuing to refine it, but having that rolling through five year or five to 10 year plan on each farm is gonna be the best opportunity to get to, to have that long-term thinking and then being able to adjust also with what happens in the markets, um, but not shying away from that or, or dramatically changing if markets change a little bit to get away from a long-term rotation that is sustainable. Thank you, Steve. And I'll, I'll add a little bit on that after after saying that. Just to, so I'd say a very small portion of our alfalfa is sold organically by less than five percent. Uh, so understanding just because you're organic doesn't mean you have to sell it organic. Uh, alfalfa in our area is quite profitable conventionally, and so looking at that, uh, just want to make sure people understand that we're not doing organic alfalfa on a majority of our acres. It's going into the conventional market. Um, and the other thing that I've seen a benefit on and my banker really likes is I'm borrowing about half the money uh, that I need to to farm and that's due to having all this income coming in at different times. And so we're, we have a lot less borrowed money from the bank to, to farm and that is through having income come in throughout the year through alfalfa, barley and things like that. So looking at the takeaways from long-term rotation, as I talked about, uh, going into organic and just thinking that you're going to do it without a well-thought-out plan is one of the biggest mistakes that we've seen is understanding the markets in your area, understanding what possible crop rotation you can do, and then how, how do we be the most successful at that crop rotation? And I, I talk about things of we, we keep a lot of our seed back. We raise non patented seed. We keep it back. We lower the cost of our seed a lot because we know our rotation. We know where the acres are going. So that's just one thing of planning has helped us. And I think we, if we figured out, we saved $30,000 last year by doing that. And those are just little takeaways of having that plan. What are you going to do? What gives you the best success? And each of these rotations is going to, to differ by region. So what I do is not necessarily what you're going to do in Minnesota or South Dakota. It might be, but understanding where your markets are, what you have access to, and how to fit that all together in the puzzle. Um, then understanding workload management, capabilities and equipment. Uh, when we do alfalfa, we put it all up, up wet and we wrap it. Uh, those are things that we had to get into. It took us three years to develop those markets. Uh, we knew we weren't going to put up high quality alfalfa in Iowa. Uh, number one, our management not that good uh, capabilities weather-wise uh, very difficult to do that and so we had to invest in equipment to put up a lot of wet alfalfa we we cut and bale in 24 to 36 and are able to hit that uh, are evolving and so the, one of the last things is is a big impact on the bottom line of organic is evaluating the cost of nutrients and how do we create those nutrients and so Thinking Western Nebraska here, higher cost of nutrients. Uh, I mean, in Iowa, we have uh, uh, abundant manure, too much. Uh, that's our manure costs are pretty low. To if you get out into a place that has animal concentration. Oh, Bryce, you're breaking up. So uh, I'll kind of bring us home here, and then we'll move to the Q and A. So again, I think what Bryce is getting at is. You know, you need to really evaluate uh, the cost of nutrients that can vary region by region based upon the fact that the majority of nutrition is going to be coming from uh, manure sources. So as you look at that, how does your rotation help balance the new cost of nutrients by creating or increasing the availability of nutrients within the cycle? So when you look at all of these dimensions together, the picture can be complex, but if you break them all out and continue to push on it, we think that there's a lot of opportunity to create successful long-term rotations for organics. With that, I do want to thank everybody who's uh, stuck with us this morning um, for the, the discussion. We do have a few questions that I'll get to, but also want to let others ask any questions they might have. So one of the questions was, will AgriSecure hold a workshop for new to organic operators to help find a market, the market buyer for organic crops, uh, including the kind of terms uh, timing and resources required. Uh, we will be holding a workshop uh, or a webinar sometime in the near future about organic markets in general. Um, and so for those of you who signed up for this one and said, yes, you'd like to hear from us in the future, you'll certainly hear about that. 
um, in terms of organic marketing and, uh, and more specifically, it does really vary region to region uh, on what opportunities there are. And so that's one of the services that AgriSecure offers organic farms is a marketing advisor to help you understand what's going on generally in the market, what are opportunities given your crop rotation to uh, find uh, buyers for that grain, and then based upon your farm logistics and storage, what are the best opportunities for you to take advantage of to both maximize the revenue but also minimize the risk on your operation. So that's something that we do as a group uh, with the members we work with, but again, we'll be holding a, a webinar kind of on the markets overall sometime. Uh, probably, given that we're getting running up close to harvest, probably shortly after the harvest time frame. Uh, in the meantime, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're always happy to talk. There was another question around um, what do you guys think the opportunity is for somebody transitioning into organic with corn being at a lower price point? Uh, and I'll, I'll give my first impressions. And there's a question around the outlook of what's going on in the market, uh, where the market's going to go. Um, so from the where is the market going to go? What we've seen through COVID, and there were some concerns that, as consumers were worried about their own individual budgets or revenue in their families, that they might shift away from organic. Uh, in fact, the opposite has happened. We've seen organic demand from consumers continue to increase. In part, that's because they're eating at home. Uh, and so when you're not eating away, there's an opportunity for you to buy premium products but still have a lower cost point on a per meal basis. So we've seen consumers continue to, to demand organic foods. And the other part of that that I've had some reading, uh, read some research on is that uh, there's a a recognition that nutrition in the diet uh, is important and the belief that organic foods may be healthier for you. Um, and so consumers are starting to trade into organics where some of them may not have been there in the past. So we believe, based upon that, that organic demand in the United States is going to be strong. Uh, and where the market goes in terms of pricing, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do believe that um, you know, we're kind of close to floor prices, uh, the floor of where prices can go, and that there will be upside potential in the longer term. However, that's just one opinion, um, and, you know, there's many opinion, opinions out there. So in terms of the opportunity, uh, we, I believe and continue to believe that organics is a, a strong opportunity for the right uh, farms. Uh, those that are going to have the opportunity to transition their acres into it over time, uh, have the wherewithal to set up the long-term rotations and uh, execute uh, at a high degree. There's certainly opportunity there, especially when you look at them relative to opportunities in conventional agriculture right now, which unfortunately are fa it's a fairly challenging market for conventional growers. So I would recommend that anyone looking into it uh, and thinking about transitioning, do the research, uh, learn as much as they can before making a decision. And of course, we're happy to, to talk to you individually about your farm operation and consider whether it might be the right fit for you and look at what the long-term economics might look like and what it could bring to your farm. Bryce or Amy, I don't know if you either of you want to bring in any other perspective on what the opportunity would be. Yeah, Steve, uh, I'm not breaking up anymore, correct? Yep, you sound good. Yeah, so I think the, the potential is still there. Uh, one difference from when we did it, or I did it as an operation, and earlier on is we had $10, $12 organic corn. So making mistakes uh, was not a huge issue with that type of margin that we, we saw before. And so... Now, one of the more important factors is eliminating those mistakes because some of them that I made could have well put me under if there wasn't $10, $12 corn at the end. So that's one of the things that we, we can provide at AgriSecure is helping prevent those mistakes that uh, uh, were made by us prior years with a, a lot larger margin of error. Um, and then the, the other thing that I look at and why we did it on our farm and continue to transition more acres is – what is the other option? Uh, 285 corn is, is not going to work uh, on our farm. 
definitely not this year, not in the long term either. And so our other option was just not any <laughs> was not too bright either. And so that's kind of where we looked at uh, continuing with organic transition. Uh, six, seven, seven dollar fifty cent corn, twenty dollar soybeans, six, five fifty, six dollar barley, and alfalfa worked pretty darn good for us. Um, and, and Amy can hit on a little bit, but one of the things that we look at is uh, at the United States, we're not a low cost producer anymore. Me and Amy have spent considerable time in Brazil. They can produce a lot cheaper than us, so I don't see the price of conventional rising anytime soon. So I, I it, truly, I think organics one of the, one of the best options out there. And so I'll let Amy touch on that a little bit if she wants to. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Bryce. Um, I know the challenges with um, the organic markets, they are definitely less than opaque. You know, they're not very transparent. They're very opaque. You don't have, you know, ag web that you can just see by the minute what the prices are trading at. Um, short term, it does look like, you know, new crop does have a little bit more robustness in corn. Um, so some of the old crop is at that $6 right now, but new crop is looking like it's closer to 7 and, um, you know, soybeans have actually throughout this time period have really been a lot more robust in terms of pricing. They, they have maintained that 18 to $20 on the feed grade end of um, soybeans. So, you know, looking at your crop rotations is really important, um, you know, both from an agronomic standpoint and an economic standpoint. But I think Bryce hit this. I mean, being in agriculture is risky, no matter if you're farming conventionally or, you um, or you know, organically, we have to be open to competition, and we have to be open to looking at ways to do things more efficiently, um, protecting the environment, you know, getting good yields, producing good crops. We just got to find ways that um, that allow for us to do all of that more efficiently and manage our margins. So, I, it, it's definitely not going to be an easy road in the future, but um, hopefully we've showed you today that organics is a very interesting road. It can provide opportunity and, you know, there, there are risks associated with it, unfortunately, as well. Thank you, Amy. And I don't see any other questions from participants, and I know that we're a little bit over time, so I do want to thank everybody for joining us today. Again, feel free to reach out to the team and to AgriSecure in general, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. And with that, we're gonna sign off. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you.